Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Robert. I uh, finally did it. I finally got to the end of my new release TBR pile. I've been working on that, it seems like, for the last month or so. Um, of course, that just means that I want to go out and buy a bunch of more new releases that I've, I've read about. But for now, I'm going to switch back after this video today. I'll switch back to some backlist uh, over the last six months or so. I've been reading slowly through all the different works of Kazuo Ishiguro. And then I have a couple of classics I want to reread that I haven't read in decades. Um, two of them are actually for the project that Eric at The Lonesome Reader is doing with his new uh, job position. And so I'll link to his video that explains the project there. And if you're interested, you can check that out. One of them, the two I've chosen from his list are Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd. I'm a huge Hardy fan, but it's been a lot of years since I've read him too. Uh, and then the other one is Charles Dickens' David Copperfield, which I've read a long time ago and had forgotten just how long that one is. So I may start with the Hardy, I'm not sure. We'll see how that goes. But the two novels that I read um, this last week, and it's been a little bit over a week, I think, since my last review video, I admit freely that I got distracted quite a bit by the first weekend of March Madness, the NCAA basketball tournament. Um, two of my schools are actually still in the tournament in the Sweet 16 that starts tonight, so I'm still kind of watching actively. Um, I taught for several years at the University of Kentucky, um, and they're in the tournament all the time, so that's not a huge surprise. But uh, Texas Tech is where I did my undergraduate work, and they're also in the Sweet 16, which that is a, a rarity. So it's kind of exciting to have two teams to yell for. Um, but it did slow me down for several days over the weekend. Uh, I didn't get a lot of reading done. The two books that I did read um, are historical novels. Um, both of them came out in 2018, so they're brand new, but uh, they're set in, in older times. The first one that I read, I absolutely loved. Uh, and I've, I've seen some different opinions from other booktubers on this book. So this may be one you have to check out for yourself because it seems to have different reactions from different people, but I just was completely captivated by it. And that is Kristen Hanna's The Great Alone. Um, if you don't know Kristen Hanna, she had a wildly popular hit novel with her last book, a World War II novel called The Nightingale, which was the first of her books that I had actually read. And I really enjoyed it. But for me, a World War II book is kind of an easy sell because I tend to really enjoy them. So when The Great Alone came out and I heard it was about Alaska, I was a little bit skeptical. Um, I don't know a lot about Alaska, but in September I read uh, Dave Eggers' Heroes of the Frontier, which is set in Alaska. and without pulling any punches. It was the worst book I read all year. And so I wasn't anxious to dive into another Alaska book right away, but I did like Kristen Hanna's previous work enough that I thought I'd give it a try. And I'm glad I did. It was, it was really delightful to me. It's the story, it's, it's set in the 1970s. It opens in 1974, um, shortly after uh, the Vietnam War has ended. The main family is the Albright family, Ernst Albright, was a prisoner of war. His, he was a gunner on a helicopter that was shot down in Vietnam. And so he was a prisoner of war for a while. And it's shortly after he's come back to the United States from that experience. And it picks up there. Uh, his wife is Cora and his daughter is Lenny. And he is a broken man when he comes back. There's just no other way to describe it. We would call it PTSD today, but at the time we didn't know about that condition in the same way. We didn't know what to call it or what to do about it. But he was angry, he was paranoid, um, he was abusive, uh, he started drinking too much, which just aggravated his anger. Uh, he wasn't able to keep a job. And so when he gets a letter from the father of one of his Vietnam friends who did not make it back from the war, set, saying to him that he has left his cabin and his land in remote Alaska to Ernt. Ernt sees that as an opportunity to start fresh, to drop out of civilization and to take his family and go live on the land. And so he does, he pulls them out of, he pulls Lenny out of school. Uh, they buy a broken down VW bus and they drive to Alaska. Um, and they are completely unprepared for what they're gonna face in the bush. 
And so a lot of the story at the beginning is them trying to learn and make preparations and Ernst seems happy for quite a while. Gradually, as the long Alaskan winter sets in, he starts to struggle more and more with his anger and his alcoholism. Uh, and so the story follows this family for a number of years in Alaska and I'm not going to tell you too many of the things that happen because that's it just spoils the fun. There are some twists and turns in this book. Uh, I say fun. It's a pretty grim story at times, but it's also, I just think it's a delight to read. Um, then it jumps back into the story in 1986. And then again in, I think it's at the very end of the book, there's a short coda section in 2009. But it's the story of what it means to be family. What does love mean uh, in the face of mental illness and abuse? Um, and how do these people survive the things that they undergo in Alaska and in their own home? And I just think it's a wonderful story. Uh, I very rarely tear up reading. Um, movies trash me, forget about it. I mean, I, I cry at the drop of a hat at a movie. If you've seen the movie The Holiday, there's a line in there, Jude Law's character calls himself a major weeper. That's, that's me at movies. Um, and I made it all the way until three pages before the end of this book, before it actually got me, but it, it did finally get me. And it's probably one of only four or five books I've ever read that has actually brought a tear to my eye. Uh, to me, it was that powerful. Other people think it went on too long. Um, I think Steve Donahue mentioned that he didn't care for it, but I didn't hear why, so I'm not really sure what his critique was. Um, so if you liked The Nightingale and you like Kristen Hanna's style, I suspect you'll like this one too. Um, I read it for that more than for the story of Alaska, but I fell in love with Alaska reading this story. This book is a love letter to Alaska as well as a family saga. So if you're interested in that kind of thing or if you're interested in Kristen Hanna's other books, you should definitely give this one a shot. This is one of the two or three best books that I've enjoyed so far in 2018. I've only think, I think I've only given three five-star reviews so far this year. Um, it seems like I average one five-star review a month and this has been it for the, for the last month. I also enjoyed the second book I read, not quite as much as The Great Alone, but I really did enjoy it. I read through it very quickly and it's 430 pages. And so for me to read through it in two days is really getting into the book. And that is The Girls in the Picture by Melanie Benjamin. And this is a story about the silent film industry, uh, which I knew nothing about. I mean, I could tell you some of the, the star names of the silent film period, but I had probably not seen any of their films. I think I've seen two or three Charlie Chaplin movies from that era, and that's about it. Uh, but this is a story based on the friendship and the working collaboration partnership of Mary Pickford, who was the queen of the silent film era, and um, the woman who becomes her scenarist or her screenwriter for much of her career, uh, Frances Marion. Um, it starts in 1914. Um, Pickford is already pretty much at the height of the, the totem pole, if you will, in silent film era. She's the queen of Hollywood at that point. Um, and Frances Marion doesn't know anything about Hollywood. She is recently divorced for the second time. She's looking to do something, but she doesn't know what. Um, and she happens to stumble across a movie set, uh, out, or a, a movie filming out in the street. Turns out it's a Charlie Chaplin film. And she's just so taken with the whole thing that she decides that I need to work in this industry somehow, but she has no idea what. At the time, she's working as a commercial artist for advertisement. Um, and she, by chance, meets Mary Pickford, who is kind of an isolated figure. Mary doesn't have a lot of friends. In fact, she probably doesn't really have any friends. And something clicks between Mary and Francis, and they become acquaintances and friends, and Mary lets Francis start helping her as kind of an assistant. She runs errands for the studios, whatever needs to be done. Um, she starts to write dialogue, even though they're silent films, she starts to write dialogue for the extras because people in the audience 
got to be where they were reading the lips of the extras in the film and none of the extras knew really what they were supposed to be saying. So she would write dialogue for them that fit the scene. And that's how she started writing scenes and gradually became a, a screenwriter. The most, uh, probably the most popular, the most famous screenwriter of the era was, was Francis Marion. And so this book is the story of their friendship, uh, their partnership, um, the marriages that they enter and leave that test their friendship. Uh, it goes from 1914 to 1969, so it covers 55 years. Uh, of course, their careers end before that, but it, it covers a large swath of history of Hollywood, uh, especially in the early years as the silent film era ends. Uh, the first talkie was actually in 1927, and so there was a pretty quick transition from the silent films to the talkies once that technology became available. Um, that was not an easy transition for Mary Pickford. Uh, she became somewhat pigeonholed in her career by playing roles of children, which she could do because she did look very young and the black and white and the, the heavy stage makeup that they used in the silent films allowed her to pull that illusion off. Uh, but by the time the talkies started to roll around, she was of an age where she couldn't really play those characters anymore. And as she tried to play more adult roles, her audience really didn't take to them. They wanted to see the little girl that they loved in all her previous films, and so she was kind of stuck. Uh, Frances Marion, on the other hand, made the transition fairly easily. She was one of the most powerful screenwriters in the silent film era, but also transitioned and wrote some of her most most famous movie she wrote for the talkies. Um, one of the things that's remarkable about these two women is that they were in a completely male-dominated, very misogynistic industry, the film industry, and they were so good that they were able to wrest control over their own creative process in a lot of ways because each one of their films that was more successful than the previous one gave them a little bit more leverage over these studios. And in, in dramatic fashion, they ended up making a break with the studios and Mary Pickford, um, the man she had fallen in love with and was soon to marry, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, Charlie Chaplin and a couple of other figures who didn't stay with the partnership founded United Artists to distribute their own films. Of course, United Artists is still around uh, and they very quickly became uh, a dominant player in the industry and changed the way the studio system worked. And so it's a fascinating story about the industry and it's a really touching story about these two women and the partnerships that they had, but also the problems their friendship had, the the heartbreak that their personal lives brought to them. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened in their lives that were just heartrending. Um, and I just found it completely um, engaging. I, I was hooked from start to finish, so much so that when I finished it this morning, I searched online to find some of Mary Pickford's films, which I had never seen. And I found one. Uh, it was one of the ones that Francis Marion was first listed as the screenwriter for. Um, I think it's called A Love Lost. I forget the title already, which is embarrassing. But um, it, it was one where for, uh, Mary Pickford was not playing a child. She was playing an adult woman. And it was not a hugely successful film, but it was one of the first films that United Artists put out and it helped them get started in their new production company. Um, and I just found it interesting. Um, Francis Marion's husband, who kind of became an actor at her insistence was also in this film. So it was interesting to see Fred Thompson as well. Uh, so I just think it's a really remarkable story. And for the historical aspects alone, I'm glad I read it because I learned so much about the industry that I had no idea had happened and how these women helped shape the industry uh, against all the odds. So it's a really, to me, it was a really engaging story. Um, I rated it, I think, a four out of five stars. Uh, but I thoroughly recommend it. it. If you like Melanie Benjamin's work, and apparently she's written a number of other books that I have not read. I think she wrote one called The Swans of Fifth Avenue that came out a couple years ago that was really popular, but I missed it somehow. Um, and she has a couple others as well. So check, check out those two books if you're interested in those topics or if you're just interested in historical fiction like I am.
Um, over the next couple of days, I'm going to try to film two videos that are new for me, um, looking ahead to some of the new releases that will come out in April, some, some novels, and some nonfiction books. Uh, and I'll give you a little sneak preview of books that I'm interested in. It's not really going to be a TBR because I don't know if I'll read them, um, but it's just ones that I'm going to be watching to see how they do and see what the reception is. Uh, they just look interesting from the descriptions to me. And then I will start reading probably the Thomas Hardy next. And so the next video you see for me that's a review will probably be involving at least one classic. And that's going to be it for me. Uh, please leave me a comment uh, if you have read these or if you're interested in knowing more about them. Um, check out Eric's channel, the video about his reading project on the classics. And I will see you again soon. Bye.